I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of m and Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter, calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard-scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the general Tom Thumb tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn through Barnum's own words about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. The Beginnings of Iranistan P.T. Barnum's European tour with his protege General Tom Thumb stretched across three years, 1844 to 1846, a long time to be away from home in an age when travel was often arduous and mail could take weeks or even months to reach the recipient. For several months, Barnum's wife Charity and their young daughters, Caroline and Helen, were with him. But by July of 1845, when the letters in our copybook begin, it is evident that Charity and the two girls had returned, as Barnum mentions to some of his correspondents how homesick and lonely he was feeling. Among this first group of letters, roughly the first hundred pages, there is one to Charity and another to Helen, who was just five years old. Barnum's August 13, 1845 letter to Charity suggests he had timed it to reach her soon after her arrival home. He expressed concern that he hadn't heard from her, adding that when he reached Bordeaux in a few days, I hope to get a letter from you announcing your safe arrival and the good health of our little family. God grant that this may be the fact. It seems an age since I have seen or heard from you. He related to Charity that although the countryside around Rochefort was delightful, he could only enjoy it if I could always feel assured that you are all well and happy. But in this state of loneliness and uncertainty, I am miserable. Charity, Caroline, and Helen had in fact returned home safely. Barnum's letter clues us into his expectation that they would be in Bridgeport at this time rather than New York City. It was the height of summer, as he suggests to Charity that she could mail letters to him directly from Bridgeport, rather than sending them into the city first. Where exactly they were staying in Bridgeport at that time, we don't know. Their future grand home in Bridgeport, Iranistan, was just in the early planning stage. And that was the main topic of Barnum's letter. Barnum's homesickness coincided with, and perhaps fueled, his desire to begin building a country home for his family. We who enjoy history feel certain twinges of excitement when we stumble upon the first mention of something that we know will later become important, and here in this letter we have such an example. 
if not the very first articulation of Barnum's plan for his famed Oriental Villa in Bridgeport, it is certainly among the first. We can easily imagine this letter as a follow-up to conversations he and Charity had in England together. The letter reveals Barnum's ideas for the lavish property he envisioned, and which he could now afford with his new wealth. We should add that around this time, September 1, 1845, Barnum wrote to a business correspondent that his American museum earned him a net profit of $25,000 a year, and that his tour in England cleared £25,000 sterling in 13 months. The letter to Charity includes a simple yet delightful sketch of a half-circle driveway, with gates at the entrance and exit, and the explanation, I want plenty of trees about the house, not too many, with two large gates in front for a carriage to enter one, and making a turn of a half-moon like this and go out at the other. Although Barnum does not mention anything about the architectural style, and perhaps it had already been decided upon, he was firm in his requirements for the landscaping, outbuildings, water quality, and sanitary conveniences. I want a nice, smooth lawn to extend around the whole house. Then, at a little distance back, I want a flower and fruit garden and hothouse. Then, clear at the back of that, I want the vegetable garden. If convenient, I would like a fish pond not far off, but I am not particular about that, as I can arrange that afterwards. I want another entrance, leading to the barn and carriage house, which must stand at some distance away from the house. Above all things, we must have good water, and if you have a house built, let it possess every possible convenience. Don't fail to have one or two apartments for baths, a nursery, a nice light apartment for my library and writing, etc. I would have one water closet in the house, perhaps. If not, let the path leading to it be covered over. It should not stand in the garden, I think. The mention of planning for a water closet, or toilet, in the house is fairly unusual at this time, but apparently some of the posh hotels in New York, Boston, and other major cities did have water closets and bathtubs in the 1840s, and it is possible that Barnum became familiar with this convenience staying at the fancier hotels while in London. Only the very wealthiest people could afford to have indoor plumbing, in the form of a gravity-fed system installed in their homes in the early to mid-19th century. For middle-class Americans, indoor plumbing didn't become affordable until the latter decades of the century, and for a vast number of people, flush toilets in the home were not the norm even in the early 1900s. Thus, Barnum's determination to have apartments for baths, and possibly a water closet in the house, was rather novel in 1845. But it wasn't a pipe dream, pardon the pun, as the completed Iranistan property did include a water tower that supplied the house. At the time of this letter, land had not been chosen, and though Barnum refers to building a home in Bridgeport, the 17-acre parcel he actually did purchase was in Fairfield, near the west boundary of Bridgeport, in an area later to be annexed by Bridgeport. Today, a portion of the property is the site of the Klein Memorial Auditorium on Fairfield Avenue. On the one hand, Barnum seemed anxious for Charity to get things rolling in acquiring property and finding a builder, so he would not have to bother upon his return. But he also cautioned her in a way that could have discouraged her from proceeding on her own. You had better not decide positively on buying a place till I have learned all the particulars of price from you, the quantity of land, etc. I half think the house had better be made of brick or stone, and that a builder in New York had better be employed. Perhaps Mr. Olmsted could advise about it, and perhaps Uncle Allenson could give you some ideas regarding it. At all events, be careful that what you do is well done, and that you do not get cheated. I half wish to have it finished this winter, for I hate above all things to be bothered with it on my return. Still, if your health is not good, or if you do not feel inclined to be bothered with it, you can let it all rest till I come home. Undeterred, though pregnant with her fourth child, Charity did find a suitable location for their future home, and Barnum returned to purchase the land the following spring. There are no surviving photographic images of the Iranistan home or property that we know of. It is likely that daguerreotype images were made, daguerreotypes were the predecessors to print photography, since the illustrations and prints of Iranistan created for publicity and decorative purposes needed an accurate source. In fact, a print showing the ruins of Iranistan after it burned in December of 1857 
is titled with the note that the scene was copied from a daguerreotype. But the silver-coated surface of a daguerreotype plate is quite delicate and easily damaged, in addition to which Barnum suffered many fire losses in his life, so perhaps it is not surprising that any daguerreotypes may have been lost to time. At the Barnum Museum, we are fortunate to have the next best thing in terms of accurate depictions of Iranistan, a pair of watercolor drawings that were likely commissioned by Barnum himself, since they were passed down through his descendants. In addition to showing the magnificent home, which resembled a portion of the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, England, the watercolors show us the landscaping, outbuildings, and half-moon driveway Barnum had wished for. In one watercolor, you can see a tall brick structure topped with an onion dome, which I assume is the water tower. You can see that image close up by viewing it in our online digital collection, where you can also browse the various prints of Iranistan and see the one architectural feature that was saved from the home. It's a treat to see these with new eyes, now having listened to Barnum's own words about his vision for Iranistan. Barnum on Humbugging and Puffing P.T. Barnum's honesty is one of the attributes we most often hear our visitors question. Wasn't he scamming people, making money from hoaxes? Well, not exactly. Yes, he made money, but his intentions were not mean-spirited, nor was he deceitful. Though we see the occasional present-day media writer characterize Barnum as a scoundrel or charlatan, a dishonest showman, that view is simplistic and fails to take into account what much of popular entertainment was about in Barnum's day. Hoaxes and humbugs are not the same thing. Hoaxes are akin to a cruel trick, and Barnum was firmly planted in the latter camp of providing entertaining amusements known as humbugs. Moreover, he wanted people to be curious and to exercise their intellect in debating whether a thing was truly a wonder of nature or a fake. So what does the man himself have to say on the subject of humbugging and puffing? Barnum's letter from Toulouse, France, to Friend Stewart, that is, C.D. Stewart, in New York, tells us plenty. Mr. Stewart had recently returned from Detroit to the American Museum in New York to assist Barnum's manager, Fortis Hitchcock. Barnum wrote to Stewart on September 11, 1845, pleased to know that he had returned, for, I am convinced that you can help my interests there very much, with your talent for scribbling, puffing, and humbugging, the last-named species of talent being particularly requisite for our line of business. For as the Lord does not work miracles nowadays, and as the people are determined to see miracles wrought, and are willing to pay for them too, of course, it is our duty, as well as pleasure and profit, to perform said miracles, or rather pretend to do so, which is quite as well, provided the thing is managed adroitly. Let humbug then be the motto, but do not confound that charming and valuable science with the stupid catchpenny impositions of the day, which bear the stamp of falsehood upon their brow, and make each victim exclaim, Curse the rascal, he has cheated me. Barnum wanted to be certain that Stuart thoroughly understood what he meant by an honest humbug and its desired effect on the audience. A genuine humbug consists in making a man feel that he has got the worth of his money, that he has seen wonders such as could not be found elsewhere on the face of the earth, that those wonders must have cost the enterprising and liberal proprietor many sleepless nights and oceans of gold, and that in fact and in truth, the beholder of the humbug is much indebted to the owner thereof for having kindly permitted him, by paying for it, to behold this precious sight, whatever it may be. Barnum further advised Stuart, A humbug to be profitable must be such a one as will bear puffing, for although you may by puffing get persons once to visit a palpable humbug, they will not visit it nor its owner twice. Of course, it was one thing to acquire the perfect humbug, but its success was quite dependent upon the right formula of promotion. Scribbling and puffing and soft-soaping influencers, that is, giving out complimentary tickets, were essential, and the humbug had to hold up to a fair degree of scrutiny and expectations so that continued promotion would not fall flat. Barnum humorously instructed Stewart on the art of puffery. Having secured the proper humbug, the first thing to be done is to puff it, 
and in these days of universal and scientific puffing, very much depends upon the manner of conducting this branch of the business. The plain out-and-out -out direct editorial puff is little better than an advertisement, and but little better. The puff indirect, or puff oblique, the puff served up as the French serve up all their viands smothered in sauce and gravy, is the best kind of a puff. If you gild it with a covering of science, cover it with an anecdote, or half smother it in poetry, it is all very well. Barnum goes on to explain why the sauce and gravy were so important, as he imparts a marketer's wisdom. The public is a queer fish, and no fish which is up to snuff will bite at the naked hook. Much depends on procuring the proper bait. More depends on placing the bait properly on the hook. In addition to asking Stewart to promote the museum and its attractions in the New York City papers, Barnum also suggested he send his scribblings to newspaper correspondents outside of the city, and to be sure and send occasional free tickets. Stewart had apparently caught the showman's attention with his talent for lively and convincing descriptions. Encouraging him to promote the newly acquired dissolving views, he wrote, You are a poet. I am not. And therefore you can do these things. I cannot. Still, I am like the man who drew the picture of a whale. He had never seen one, but he knew how one looked. Sixteen years later, Barnum would, in fact, be showing live beluga whales in his American museum, a first, and that was no humbug. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pino, and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.